Now we will consider God's Word and we come to uh, the uh, Psalm 46 is our sermon text this evening. I do invite you to, we're going to also, as I mentioned this morning, look at a parallel passage in the New Testament. First Psalm 46, we'll read it in its entirety. The whole thing is our text. It is a fairly small psalm by, ver- by comparison to others. And then we will look over also at this same theme that is repeated in Hebrews chapter 5, where we see the Lord Jesus Christ as our refuge and strength. First then, Psalm 46. Let's hear God's word. To the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah, a song for Alamoth. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered His voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Now, if you would turn with me over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. Keep your finger here. We'll come right back to it in a moment. But Hebrews 5, and give careful heed especially to that theme of Jesus Christ as our refuge and strength in times of trouble. We read about Him by comparison that every high priest is taken from among men that taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer gifts and sacrifices for sin he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also subject to weakness because of this he is required as for the people so also for himself to offer sacrifices of for sins And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. Now, if you would move to verse 15, please. Oh, excuse me. Uh, If you'd move over to chapter 6 and verse 15 now. And so... After he had, Jesus had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's God's word for God's people. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, in the news, undoubtedly it has not escaped your attention, the 
uh, situation of refugees, especially from the Middle East, they tell us that about two million refugees, especially Christian refugees, have had to flee their homeland sometimes with just the clothes on their back, in order to find refuge, safety, and escape from ISIS and other Islamic militants. In fact, it is, uh, I've learned by reading World Magazine that there are many parts of California that are being inundated by folks from the Middle East, of Christians of various stripes who have fled here in order to find refuge. There are many people who have come to these shores, of course, for centuries, but of late, this is the particular situation, who have come to our shores to seek refuge. This psalm reminds us to commit ourselves with confidence to God's protection in Christ, to flee to Him as our refuge, to fearlessly rely on Him as our protector, it will challenge us to have no doubt that though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed His truth to triumph through us. That prince of darkness grim, we need not tremble for Him. His rage we can endure, because His doom is sure. One little word, namely, Jesus shall fell Him. A mighty fortress is our God. And there are four things we want to consider as we think of that theme here in this psalm. First, since our God is a mighty fortress, we, meet, we need not fear. We see that in verses 1 through 3. Since He is our mighty fortress, He is with us in the city of God. 4 through 7. Then we will, since He is our mighty fortress we will consider afresh His victories and we will be still and know that Christ will be exalted. First of all then, since our God is a mighty fortress, we will not fear by His grace. We need not fear. You'll notice as we, perhaps you noticed as we read this psalm that several names of God are here. We begin with the name Elohim. The three in one. He is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. The same word is translated protector. It is translated shelter in Psalm 61. The word refuge, that is. It is also tr translated strong refuge in Psalm 71 or fortress in Psalm 91. We, by contrast, brothers and sisters, even as Christians, are weak and helpless and we need a safe refuge. And here already we have this covenant, covenantal language, the covenant of grace laid out for us here in terms of safety, a place to go as a hen gathers her chicks coming under the wings of our covenant God. A picture of our covenant God graciously condescending to be our refuge and strength in Christ Jesus, His Son. There is no safety in any other refuge. He is our refuge. That little three-letter word is important. He is not a refuge for all. We mentioned this morning that the majority of the population does not find any refuge in Christ Jesus. But for you, in Christ, that covenant of grace comes to you as well. That language of covenant, He is your God and you are His people. For you, He is your refuge and strength. He is our refuge and our strength. The, the psalmist now magnifies the omnipotence of God. Our, a refuge is nothing if it is not strong, if it is not a strong refuge. A weak refuge is no refuge at all. But He is not only our refuge, but our strength. More than able to protect Christ's sheep. We have a need as, as believers and even as human beings, not only for a safe refuge on the one hand, but for a strong refuge. All other refuges are weak. 
But your strength, beloved, comes from God in Christ. Think of Jesus there with His disciples on the boat in the Sea of Galilee. There they are being tossed by the winds and the waves. And they cry out to Him, Don't you care that we perish? And one little word from Him, Peace! Be still! And we see them come under His protective care. We find that little boat becoming a refuge because Christ is in it. And so, He is a very present help in trouble. And so here we have an encouragement to remember, brothers and sisters, as Christ's sheep, that we are the special objects of His care. Not because we deserve to be so, but because He has made it so by His sovereign grace. The language here of very present help in trouble, and perhaps you have some other language in your translation, literally could be read this way from the original Hebrew, an abundantly available help. Which is exactly what we need. An abundantly available help. And this is fleshed out in other places. For example, in Deuteronomy 4, verse 7, we read, The Lord is saying to His people, What great nation is there that God has so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon Him? There's the idea again of abundantly available help. And again in Psalm 145, it's put this way. The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear Him. He will also hear their cry and save them. Abundantly available help. A very present help. Abundantly available help in trouble. That language, perhaps not evident in your Bibles, but it's in the plural in the original. In troubles, literally. In, or, and the idea there, the, the plural there has the idea in tight places. We in our vernacular talk about being in a tight spot. That's the exact idea here. In tight spots, He is abundantly available help. No matter how often troubles come, no matter what form troubles take for you this week and in the weeks to come, He is and He always has been and He always will be an abundantly available help to His people in our time of need. Because we belong to Him by faith, we've been purchased and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that very fact we celebrated this morning, because that is true. He is our, our Father. He is, think of in terms of this picture of a father protecting his child in some kind of trouble. And ask yourself the question, what would you do to protect your child? And if you would do almost anything to protect your child, how much more your Father in Heaven? This is language of security, isn't it? Our refuge and strength. A, an abundantly available help in tight places, tight spots. Our skills can't bring us security. Highly educated and skilled Christians still suffer losses. Family members can't provide permanent security. Friend, nor can friends, nor can business associates. All these sources of security can be snatched away from us in a moment. Think of Job. Our security is not in our net worth any more than his was. And so we sing with the hymn writer, other refuge have I none. Hangs my helpless soul on Thee. And in the Lord's Supper this morning, we celebrated that fact that God in Christ is your refuge. So run to Him, beloved. Consider yourselves safe in Him this week and every week. Flee to your refuge in prayer often this week. And He will shield you from the troubles that come your way. Or, He may if He does not shield you in one particular instance, He will give you the strength to bear your troubles. One way or another, He will be your refuge. And He is your refuge and strength even in severe circumstances. Even in those severe circumstances, Christians need not fear. 
And we certainly are in severe circumstances these days. The psalmist lays that out for us in picturesque and colorful and even hyperbole in verses 2 and 3. Provi- the providence of God sometimes is very severe. And because we live in a fallen world, we are sometimes not shielded from it in that sense. And it's not so hard for us as Christians to be confident of God as our refuge and strength, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we are having fairly smooth sailing on glassy seas. But now when the circumstances get severe, as we see in verses 2 and 3, the triune God is still our refuge and strength. Sometimes He brings about such confusing providences that it seems like our little world will come to an end. Even immovable mountains seem insecure, to paraphrase the language of verses 2 and 3. At times our circumstances seems like, seem like raging rapids or a tsunami crashing down on us. Our stable lives seem to shake beneath us like an 8.5 earthquake. In those times, can we really say we will not fear? Can we be that boastful to say, though those things happen, I will not be afraid? The psalmist is not unrealistic, nor is the Holy Spirit who inspired him. It doesn't mean that mature Christians are emotionless, that mature Christians even are always fearless or never afraid. We just made mention of the apostles themselves on the lake. Afraid, don't you care that we perish? We perish, they cry out. Christ's sheep are not made of stone, are we? But we are not overwhelmed. We can say with the apostle in 2 Corinthians, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted more and more, it seems, as the years go by, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. That the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body also. How is it that we can make this declaration of faith with confidence with the Apostle? The fact, it is because Christ, by His Word and Spirit, says to you and me, Fear not. Two of the most wonderful words in all of the Bible. Fear not. And that word from our Savior alleviates and subdues our fears. When we cry out in our extreme circumstances, Lord, don't you care that we perish? He replaces fear with hope by the power of His Word and Spirit. He replaces fear with calmness and perseverance and a sense of peace in the storm. As we sing sometimes, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. A mighty fortress is our God, and therefore we need not fear, brothers and sisters. That's the first thing. Secondly, a mighty fortress is our God, therefore He is with us in the city of God. We read in verse 4, There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. Without being facetious or using street language facetiously, it does seem in our country that all hell has broken loose sometimes. And when hell and Satan seem about to destroy Christ's church, remember that Christ ascended and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty in the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High could be translated this way, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. So therefore, by God's grace in Christ, He is able to give you a 
a calming spirit as if you were sitting gladly by a quiet, gentle stream in the midst of all this hellish goings-on. In the midst of all that, in that storm, Christ urges you and I to be glad and refreshed. He does so also in Psalm 36 where He says that we shall be abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. There's that reference to the city of God again, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in that same psalm, there is this promise. And you give them drink from the river of your pleasure. Do you see the contrast on the one hand? Everything in a turmoil in verses 2 and 3. And then this picturesque, serene scene of a, a gentle stream flowing. And there we are camped by it, enjoying the quiet peace of that serene setting. As Christ's disciples, it's not that we bury our heads in the sand. We don't take lightly perilous times or perilous people. But by God's grace in Christ and by the Holy Spirit at work in us, we can say by grace through faith, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can say, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Christ gives us the faith in perilous times to go on and to, with faith to trust in God. And as a result, He makes us glad. He can even put a smile on our face in such times, convinced of our preservation and security in Jesus Christ. And may the Lord make you thus confident, brothers and sisters, That you too can say, I will not be afraid by God's grace. Christ alone is willing and able to give you that peace of mind when there's trouble all around you. Think in those times. Perhaps one of those times will come even this week. Who knows what the news holds for us this week. Certainly some troublous times will come to our minds. But when they do, think of Christ on His throne as we have him pictured in Revelation 22. He showed me a pure river of a water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves were for the healing of the nation. He is with us in the city of God as our refuge and strength, and He makes us glad in the city of God, even in the storms. And also, verse 5 reminds us, He makes us, He will help us. He will help His city. Verse 5, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. How is it that Christ's church, that you and I as members of Christ's church, by His grace, can be so sure of our security and our safety? How can we have such confidence to say we will not fear? How is it that the gates of hell, as powerful as they are and as outnumbered as we are, how is it that they will not prevail against Christ's church? It is because the triune God dwells with us. He lives amongst amongst us. As Jesus promised the apostles, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there are. I am there in the midst of them. And as with the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the seven golden lampstands, so it is with us today. Within the midst of those seven lampstands is one like the Son of Man. He holds the seven stars in His right hands and walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. All this to say and repeat that all our peace, all our safety, all our security, all our confidence depend on Christ's presence in our midst. He dwells among us to help the city of God, to help His church. Now the psalmist is honest about the fact that His help doesn't come immediately. 
that his help doesn't always come as soon as we finish our prayer. It's not always the case with us as it was with Daniel that while he was praying, an archangel is sent on the way to come and rescue us. Sometimes there is delay ordained by God himself for his own purposes. But his help does come. His help always comes right on time. The psalmist says, just at the break of dawn. Not in the middle of the night. Not at midnight. Not at three o'clock in the morning when you feel like you can't go another step. But at the break of dawn. Because he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. You think of perhaps some night that perhaps you can think even now as I speak of the worst night in your life when it seemed like dawn would never come. The longest night of your life perhaps. But perhaps in that same setting you can also think of how as you spent time in prayer help did come and here you are safe and sound. And so it is. We have that promise here. He is with the city of God. He makes glad the city of God. He will help the city of God. And to use the words of Martin Luther, one little word shall fell them, the enemy. Verse 6. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered His voice. And the earth melted. You see the poetic style here. This of contrast. On, we see this tumult in verses 2 and 3. And then a calm and serene setting. Then we see tumult again here in verse 6. And, uh, and above and in it all we see the attributes of God. The, His sovereignty by, as continually restraining all uprisings and all rebellions. Could things be worse than they are today in California? On some days you might not think so, but they certainly could be worse and probably will be worse. But the good news is that He is more than strong enough to undo all the efforts of the enemies of Christ. We think about their efforts in just this past decade. It's staggering to us sometimes to think how far our, na- our, our state especially and our nation has come so fast in terms of their downward spiral into the abyss of immorality. And yet, many times in the history of redemption, the sovereignty of God has been displayed for us as He exercised His omnipotence to preserve the church of our Lord Jesus Christ And not only do we don't have to go back millennia, many times in the past 20 centuries, the enemies of Christ have been huge in numbers and have tried to harm and destroy the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. And yet, here we are by His grace. The words there um, in verse 6 could be translated, the kingdom's staggered or one translation says the kingdoms tottered the earth will melt by the word of God the sovereign God all he needs to do as Martin Luther said one little word shall fell them all he needs to do is employ his voice and they will melt away and what comfort is here beloved what then shall we say to these things if God be for us Who can be against us? So what if 70% of Americans become hostile to conservative Protestant Christians and and to Christ church? Christ will defend the apple of His eye. He always has and He always will. One way or another. We read in Zechariah 2, For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you for he who touches you touches the apple of my eye God is our refuge and strength he is with the city of God he makes glad the city of God he will help his city and one little word shall fell them 
And in verse 7, we see that the Lord of hosts is on our side. As Martin Luther said, our safety too secure. Well, that's another hymn that we'll sing momentarily. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Luther translated it in his hymn, Lord Sabaoth, His name. And some of you know that means the Yahweh of hosts. And these precious promises here are ours. The precious promise of verse 7 is ours because we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The covenant God of all the armies of heaven is with you in Christ, beloved. Sometimes the, old, the language of the Old Testament lays that out for us in pictures of one chasing a thousand. You have been adopted. The covenant God of the armies of heaven has become your loving Father in Christ. To them, He is a fearful covenant Lord of all the armies of heaven. To you, He is Abba, Father. You have been adopted into the family of Jacob spiritually. He is your refuge in Christ. If you're not adopted, if, you, if one here is not adopted yet into that family, the Lord of hosts is to be feared. But you, beloved Christians, have been made sons and daughters of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And He has demonstrated His power to defend and preserve you against all odds and all enemies. Did the Lord defend Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Then will He not defend His church, His sons and daughters of Jacob? And so the psalmist here exalts the attributes of God, His unstoppable, impregnable power, His unfailing, eternal, fatherly love for you in Christ Jesus. Calvin says, and I'll have a few quotes from him, so I hope I won't overdo it. Calvin says that our faith may rest truly and firmly in God. We must take into consideration at the same time these two parts of his character. His immeasurable power by which he's able to subdue the whole world under him and his fatherly love which he has manifested in his word. When these two things are joined together, there is nothing which can hinder our faith from defying all the enemies which may rise up against us. Nor must we doubt that God will succor us since He has promised to do it. And as to His power, He is sufficiently able also to fulfill His promise. For He is the God of armies. Lord Sabaoth, His name. Whatever evil He sends upon you in this troubled life, in this veil of tears, He will turn to your good for He's able to do it being Almighty God and willing also, being a faithful Father. A mighty fortress is our God and therefore we need not fear. And therefore He is with us in the city of God. Then the third thing in verses 8 and 9. Now we are called by the psalmist and exhorted to consider afresh his protective works in light of all that's been said. There are two things now for us to consider afresh. Not that we've never considered them before or won't in the future. But let us consider them afresh. One, His devastating providences. And two, His victories. There's nothing like taking a walk down memory lane in when you are praying to remind yourself of what God has done for you in the past to give you confidence to face the future. In Christ. So consider afresh his devastating providences. Come, verse 8, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. Even Christians today, I'm sad to say, are tempted to talk about luck instead of God's providence, or just chance or circumstances. We as Christian, a Christian community can sometimes get sleepy as we analyze His desolations in the earth. I mean specifically in behalf of His church. And here we are redirected, our minds are redirected to magnify His omnipotence in preserving His church. 
which Calvin says is commonly despised or not estimated as it ought to be, end quote. Consider the countries that are hostile to Christ. Yahweh uses creation to slow down or stop persecution from time to time, whether it's by earthquake or some other natural, what we call natural disaster. Look at His works then and be strengthened and courageous in Christ. Has He preserved you, little flock? Can you say, this? here I raise my Ebenezer, hitherto by Thy help I am come. Then may your hearts be persuaded, beloved, that His promises in Christ Jesus never fail. Let us not be enumbered among those who shut their eyes to the fact that by His works, the triune God, even in the 21st century, makes desolations in the earth in order to protect His people. Let us not be indifferent to His works of redemption and creation and providence or ungrateful for His mighty works. Let us behold the works of the Lord this week again and this month and this year as by His hands He upholds heaven and earth with all its creatures, and so governs them with all creatures, that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, indeed all things come not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. Consider afresh His devastating providences. Verse 8, and now verse 9, consider afresh His victories. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two and burns the chariot in fire. Well, yes, Pastor, we know He did that in the Old Testament. We know the stories. We know the story of Sennacherib when they get up one morning and there's 185,000 of the enemy laying dead, nobody having raised a sword to do anything. But has the Lord caused wars to cease in your lifetime in order to protect His church? He ended the Vietnam War and many Vietnamese Christians live in this country today as a result of it. What about the Cold War? You say that young people don't know anything about the drop drills or the fears of not Russia dropping an ICBM on us sometime. Maybe you don't even know what an ICBM, maybe some of you are too young to even know what that means, intercontinental ballistic missile with nuclear warheads. But some of us lived in fear of that. But He preserved us, didn't, us? didn't He? He preserved His church in America and around the world from the great bear. Has He protected you to bring it home to the 21st century? Has He protected you from terrorists? Has He protected His church and preserved Christians in the United States of America? Though many chant death to America? If that's true, then he, will He not continue to protect His church? And so the Lord uses the psalmist here to challenge you and me to look for peace, not to the White House or to Congress, but to Christ. Even then, when the world seems to become becoming increasingly violent, Christ the King is still able to make war cease to the ends of the earth, to shatter the weapons of warfare, to burn them in the fire. Consider afresh His protective works. But there's one more thing verse in the fourth place. Since our God is a mighty fortress, be still and know that Christ will be exalted. Literally, I said it loudly like that because literally the word we would say, shut up! That's what the language is here. Be quiet. Be still. Know that I am God. Are you quaking in your boots? Shut up. Be quiet. Listen. Now the psalmist seems to speak, first of all, to Christ's enemies. Shut up. In persecuting Christians, Christ's enemies don't think that they fight against God. They imagine that their beef, their argument is only with bigots and homophobes and Islamophobes like us, say they. Not with the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They have no beef with Him, they say. But the psalmist shows us here in clear language 
what Christ the King says to his enemies. Be still. Be quiet. Shut your mouths. But secondarily, God also speaks to his covenant people here in this strong language. We have that, we know that because in another place in Psalm 4, he says, Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Trust in the Lord, he says there. Trust in the Lord. Be still, even when you're watching the news. And so, therefore, let us, his people, give him the glory willingly that he alone deserves. And be still. And know that He will be exalted among the nations and in the earth. And to claim that as our credo. Another quote from Calvin. He warns them that if they proceed to act like madmen, His power is not enclosed within the narrow limits of Judea. That it will be no difficult matter for Him to stretch forth His arm to the Gentiles and heathen nations that He may glorify Himself in every land. Or to put it another way, can the Lord reach into the Middle East and stop ISIS? Christ will be exalted. And He has more than enough strength and more than enough weaponry to get the job done to protect His church. To gather, defend, and preserve for Himself a chosen communion in the true faith. And so the psalmist closes in verse 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. Here's that refrain again. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Think about this. As he closes this psalm, he's, it's as if he says, Now go and look at his self exalting works. Christ, the King and the Commander in Chief of the angelic armies, is omnipotent and armed with weapons of mass destruction. And He will defend and preserve His church until we see Him face to face. Until the church militant is no more. Until every Christian joins the church triumphant forever and ever. A mighty fortress is our God, beloved. Be comforted by God in Christ when things look bad this week and in the weeks to come. Praise God for the great things that He has done in Christ against our enemies and His our spiritual enemies. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. The public enemies of Christ worldwide when they seem to be unstoppable. We can experience spiritual security and peace of mind, beloved, by God's grace. Be assured and comforted that God in Christ has and will continue to glorify His name and His Son. A mighty fortress is our God, therefore we need not fear. Therefore He is with us in the city of God. Therefore we need to consider afresh, even this week, His victories again. Both and on the pages of Scripture and our own personal victories and our corporate victories as a body of Christ. And therefore we need to heed His word to be still and know that Christ will be exalted. Amen.